Hi, I'm Femi OK. Today on the stream, we're talking about a social media streaming app called Clubhouse that is growing in popularity. There's a lot of buzz around it this week because it is rolling out on Android phones around the world. Clubhouse describes itself as a space for casual dropping conversations. But is it, is it a safe space for those conversations to happen? Let's hear from a spokesperson for the Iran Guardian Council. This is what he has to say. Clubhouse has made debate a bit more direct. In my opinion, there is no issue with the essence of these apps, and if they are used correctly, they would work for the growth and awareness of the people and the youth. I definitely did a double take when I heard that comment. Here to unpack Clubhouse's pros and cons and challenges, we have Nagar, Melissa and Mark. Great to have you all here on the stream. Nagar, welcome back to the stream. Remind our audience who you are, what you do. I'm Negar Mortazavi, a journalist and political commentator based in Washington. I also host the Iran podcast. Lovely to see you. Hello, Melissa. Welcome back to the stream. Ex describe yourself to our guests who may not have seen you before. Hi, I'm Melissa Chen. I'm a journalist based in Berlin. I work on a lot of different kinds of stories, but among one of them, I look at the strand of looking at China beyond its borders. Nice to have you. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the stream. Tell our audience who you are, what you do. Hi, I'm Mark Owen Jones. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of Middle East studies, and I research social media disinformation and harassment. And I'm particularly interested in the negative potential of technology. Thanks for being here, guests. Really nice to see you. And audience, if you're online on YouTube right now, you can be part of this conversation as well. Have you experienced Clubhouse? Have your friends experienced Clubhouse? Tell us what it's been like. Is it a place where you can speak freely or are you concerned? Jump into our comment section and be part of today's show. Now, you're not supposed to record anything in Clubhouse unless you tell people, but Nagar has sent us some screen grabs. So I'm going to show you some of these screen grabs. And it's they're kind of impressive. Nagar, will you tell everybody how impressive they are? I'm going to click through a couple of them. What, what are we seeing here, for instance? What's this? Sure. So what we've seen on Clubhouse, aside from a lot of the conversations that are by regular citizens and also some activists and journalists, we're seeing opposition figures in the country as well as government officials holding long conversations with a range of different um, users on various topics. In this one, we're seeing the Iranian foreign minister, the Iranian foreign ministry spokesperson dropping into a room with 8,000 people, taking questions from some journalists, some regular citizens. And this one that we're looking at right now, this is the daughter of the former president of Iran, Faiza Hashemi, who is right now considered an opposition. She dropped on Clubhouse into a room for about six hours. Um, being very critical of the current government, of the supreme leader, which being critical of is a red line in Iranian politics, and just being very frank and taking some tough and challenging questions from the audience. So it's definitely a new um, opening mm. for political discourse in Iran. Melissa, I remember when you were first tweeting about what was going on in some of these rooms in Clubhouse. So you, you can start a room, you can moderate a room. This is all audio, so you don't actually see the people unless they've got their, their little faces there on the icons. And, and I thought I was, I was in the rooms with you. I have a lot of feels you post or in on February the 5th, listening to mainland Chinese in China, also overseas, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, exchange ideas on Clubhouse, but one of them is deep anger that the Communist Party has done this to us. Melissa. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear the description of Clubhouse and um, how uh, people in Iran are engaging, because I see such parallels. There is this intensity and uh, people log on for hours at a time, especially in February and March when there was a lot of access or, or at least easier access than the situation now, because eventually, as, as a lot of you know, um, China just made it all the more difficult to access the app. But there was that moment when you had all these Chinese speakers uh, from within China, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, those in Taiwan, sort of engaging with each other in a way that I think audio really lends itself to this intimacy where you do feel like you're in a room. Um, you know, it, it is it is not private. It is public, mm. very much so. Um, and of course, people 
still act differently as if they've walked into somebody's living room. And I think that's facilitated a lot of the really intense conversations that you hear among Chinese speakers and, of course, in Iran and parts of the Middle East as well. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with the intimacy thing. I think there's something very unique and novel about the audio aspect of Clubhouse. Um, and I would agree. I think what um, Nagar and Melissa have both expressed is this general enthusiasm that we've seen greet the advent of Clubhouse in the region. And I don't think this is anything new. What we see every time there's a new technology uh, that comes up, whether it's Twitter, Facebook or Clubhouse, is this kind of uh, quick uptake. There's a lot of buzz around it and people want to be, uh, you know, taking and trying this new technology. There's a bit of FOMO for those who don't take it up. And I think this can accelerate that kind of user engagement and that immediacy with which people use it. But I think that's part of the problem and people need to be cautious. I think there's a honeymoon period with any new technology. And this honeymoon period is that enthusiasm. And it's very easy for people to let their guard down and say things that they wouldn't ordinarily say. And in authoritarian regimes, which are obviously dominant in, in the Middle East and, and obviously in China, uh, this can be hugely problematic. And we've already seen examples that I'm, I will talk about later mm -hmm. of how uh, authoritarian regimes are trying to co-opt that space in which we see critical discussions and create a space of surveillance as they have done with other social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. And this is particularly true in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Nagar, uh, it, it, it almost feels like in Iran, though, Clubhouse is being embraced in a, in a slightly different way because it almost feels, to, to Mark's point, once the authorities, <laughs> once government officials realised what was going on in these rooms, then they were either stopped or infiltrated. But for Iran, it seems like the conversations are still continuing and that they're being quite useful, Nagar. That is true. We have to also remember this is an interesting period in Iranian politics. There is an outgoing administration. We're about a month away from a presidential election, which will see a change of administration happens every eight years, every two presidential elections. So it's a time that the state, the entire state, wants kind of an excitement around this political event, more participation from the population. And that's one thing Clubhouse is helping, both the government officials and the opposition in a way or other, even if they're um, talking against participation in the election, even if they're talking about the limitations or the problems, the actions not being fair or free, they're still talking about the elections. A lot of the political talk on the Iranian clubhouse is about the election, and that's creating an excitement. That's one issue. And second, as Mark is saying, um, it's this honeymoon phase. I agree with that. It's been the, uh, the case with most social networks that the state is still in the figuring out phase of trying to understand if this is good for them, if this is bad for them, weigh the pros and cons, and also try to understand the ways that they can uh, limit it or control it or monitor it or censor it, or eventually, if they can't deal with it or if they get too much out of hand, just completely ban it. So I feel like that the, the Iranian state is still at that stage of trying to figure out, and there's also infighting among the political factions. So we saw the foreign minister, we saw... Uh, the IT minister, the foreign ministry spokesperson, these are from the moderate factions of the Iranian political system that are embracing more of this dialogue with the public, as opposed to the hardliners who have most of the control on broadcast media and all these other uh, empires where they can have the one-sided uh, monologue with the population. And this clubhouse, in a way, is also breaking that monologue. Melissa, this headline here that you, you and the story that you filed for foreign policy, China ends the clubhouse spring, just a matter of time. I think your tweets helped that end the spring even faster, Melissa, because you were, what is going on here? What were the stories? What were the, can you, can you retell one story that you heard? Because you were so shocked that these conversations were happening. And that will help us understand why China really just said, shocked. this has, we are shutting this down. Yeah, I mean, you had conversations where ethnic Han Chinese, that's the majority in China, in China were talking to Uyghurs, um, the ethnic Turkic Muslim minority in China that is, is experiencing a lot of suppression, right? There are detention camps, the UN has estimated that a million uh, Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities have been um, put in these camps in China 
And several legislative governments have called this and labeled it genocide. Uh, so suddenly you are having people in China discussing genocide in China and some citizens saying, wow, I, I didn't realize this was happening. And that kind of intensity, I was like, whoa, this is like more than the third rail, right? Like this is just the kind of conversation you wouldn't have in China. So it really was a matter of time. And I think it's really important to to point out, of course, that 1.4 billion people in China, very few people uh, were able to actually access the Clubhouse app. You're talking about only iPhone users in February and March. So let's put it all in context. But still, it was just an incredible moment where you had engagement between groups that you just don't normally see in that way. Mark, I want to play something to you, and this is the, it's almost a very similar story. It's what happened in Turkey, the freedom of speech, and then suddenly Turkish officials beginning to cotton on to what was happening. Come off the back of this comment, Mark, and tell us what else is happening around the Middle East with Clubhouse that you've seen. Let's have a look, first of all. In the case of Turkey, social media platforms are under heavy government surveillance and people are routinely detained for their posts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. So in January, when students at Boğaziçi University were trying to expose the government's authoritarian interventions against the university and, and mobilize grassroots resistance, Clubhouse became a key tool for them. And for many weeks, it functioned as a relatively safe space where they could reach a broad audience. But as soon as the government discovered the app, of course, it also began to monitor and police those discussion rooms and flooded the app with its own supporters to try to dominate the conversation. And people still use Clubhouse, but as with other social media platforms, it's no longer really a safe space for free speech. No, yeah. I would I would completely uh, agree with those sentiments. And I think it's very interesting actually seeing and comparing the different sponsors from various governments. I would say the Turkish response is similar to what we've seen in the Middle East in places like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I mean, Oman, for example, has a different response entirely, and that blocked Clubhouse from being used. Uh, it was rumored that UAE had blocked it from being used, but that wasn't never fully confirmed. But I think what's very interesting about this space is that in the Gulf in particular, we've come on the back of a long series of uh, social media platforms being used in very high profile surveillance cases. And I think despite this, there was this kind of opening that we saw, but we've seen some really bizarre things occurring on Clubhouse that again show how different platforms are used in different ways for surveillance. One of the things that I saw early on was a Saudi, uh, US based Saudi activist set up a group uh, that was talking about racism in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, which is obviously a, a big problem. And then as soon as you set up this group, uh, people who supported the government, anonymous accounts who supported the government, they took uh, screen recordings of the clubhouse, they highlighted who was in that room, and mm. then they broadcast that on Twitter. Yeah. And although you're not allowed to record, yeah. obviously, on clubhouse within the app, there's no inter platform agreement that stops people recording something on clubhouse and then putting it on Twitter. And I've seen that happen several times in uh, similar rooms where controversial issues are being discussed. And other things are bizarre. I remember I was participating in a panel uh, that was discussing the human rights record of Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And um, what would happen is that you'd have these planted people in the room who were supportive of the government, and they'd eventually get on the speaker section to ask a question. And then in several instances, they started attacking individual members of the panel uh, you know, and also giving a kind of very pro-government, very, you know, towing the line spiel uh, in a very kind of aggressive and accusatory tone. And I've seen this happen, seen this happen several times, too. Uh, I think one of my one final example I give that I say was my favorite, that, but that was very alarming. I went into one room where every speaker and there was about 40 or 50 speakers in that room all had the same identical profile picture of Mohammed bin Salman. So it was like a very much a big brother is watching you kind of vibe. Mm. I took, I mean, I took a screenshot for my own personal use and it's just bizarre seeing the same image uh, of the country's ruler over and over again. So these messages, which are then publicized, remind people that surveillance is occurring. And you have to remember the trick with surveillance is surveillance doesn't have to be continuous in its action. The whole point and effectiveness of surveillance is when there is a fear of surveillance. Right. So if you can convince people on a number of occasions that there is a dangerous surveillance, that can be sufficient to convince them that there's always some opportunity and chance of surveillance. And I think that's really what's happening. Uh, we're seeing in, in Clubhouse in the Middle East. 
There's something interesting, if I may add, about the case of Iran, because Clubhouse, I feel like it's occupying or it's carving a space between broadcast media, which is television, radio, or even more traditional media, and social media. What's happened on Iran social media or Persian social media, Twitter, Facebook, where, especially Twitter, where it was supposed to be hosting these national dialogues, is that it's become very much weaponized by various mm. states, various political groups, interest groups. You see massive, massive troll armies um, by, supported by the Iranian government, by the Saudi government, Israeli groups, and also the U.S. State Department funds uh, some of these um, uh, groups. And it really steers the conversation away from organic dialogue among citizens to the point that it's become very radicalized, very toxic, and ordinary people, when you talk about Persian Twitter, it's just something that people don't want to get involved in. They may go on to read, but everyone talks about how it's so toxic. Clubhouse has broken mm. that sentiment to some extent. One is that it's hard to have set up armies on Clubhouse, or at least they haven't figured it out. You need a working phone, you need an actual voice, you need to pretend like you're, real, you're a real person. It's hard to have one person sit at a computer and run 100 Twitter accounts like they do on Twitter, on Clubhouse. And it's also voice. So even the real people who are at each other's throats on Twitter, just because it's over text and sometimes anonymous accounts, it seems like when they're talking to each other, when they hear the other person, when they have to use their own voice, there's just an element of more civility that is, that is uh, prevalent in the conversations. Now, that is changing to some extent. I see people insulting each other, attacking each other, even becoming vulgar, but it's less prevalent than what we have seen on Twitter, although these armies have had about a decade to mobilize on Twitter. So we'll have to wait and see what happens on Clubhouse. Yes, let me just bring yeah. you Matt DeBartz here, who, who makes a point that, that you are all talking to, which is you can't really behave like you're in your own country if your own country wouldn't like you to say these things out aloud. Here's Matt. So when a Chinese user uses WeChat, which is a major social media app in China, most users know that their text, their audio, their video will be accessible by Tencent, WeChat's parent company, and by the Chinese government if necessary. Now on Clubhouse, because it's an American company, because it's audio only, and because to access it, a user had to have an app store location outside of the mainland of China, users may have thought that their behavior on the app was more private than their behavior on WeChat. And our research really sought to emphasize that Chinese users should expect that their behavior on Clubhouse is accessible to the Chinese government and take precautions accordingly. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it really kind of aligns with what I report on, which is looking at China's impact beyond its borders. I think we tend to think of that in very rudimentary terms. Um, you know, the whole Huawei thing with 5G. Um, but you see the long arm of authoritarianism sort of reach out and impact a U.S. Uh, app, right, which is what Clubhouse is, and influence the behavior of people who are beyond the borders of China in terms of modifying their behavior. They could be Chinese citizens working abroad, um, but also, you know, the fact that China did eventually then even block that access uh, to the app um, for those who are international um, essentially made it so that the Chinese diaspora, who, which was having these conversations, suddenly couldn't. Uh, so it was heartbreaking when, when that did happen, I believe in March. Um, and I think it really does emphasize how authoritarianism can creep into democratic societies in the most unusual, unusual ways and, and in ways you don't think about. Mm. Mark, I'm just wondering about the safety aspect of, of being on Clubhouse as I have the app on my phone, so I'm asking you this for me and for our global community. Azel makes this point. Have a listen and then come off the back of what she's saying. Clubhouse distinguishes itself from other social media platforms for its space for dialogue. Activists can now penetrate people through their stories and voices, unlike the case of tweets, for example. Yet challenges and risks are many, especially in rooms that are controlled by propaganda machines that are often exploiting tools such as electronic armies and bots to push forward discussions favorable to their regimes, dump fake news, 
collect data and attack human rights activists in Clubhouse and beyond. Yeah, I, I think this very much ties in um, with with the uh, the previous comments about privacy. What there is no guarantee that what happens on Clubhouse will stay and be transient in the room. And I'm not, I'm not talking about whether or not or for how long the company Tencent or uh, not Tencent, but who the Clubhouse in this case mm. retain data for. I'm talking about, for example, if you are an authoritarian government, it is trivial for you to, for example, have a group of people who might ordinarily be tasked with trolling or, or harassing people or spreading propaganda online to search for rooms and just record the content of those rooms on a database. Yeah. It's trivial. So yeah. regardless of the terms and conditions that are stated in, in, in the official agreements when you download something from an app store, you have no guarantee what's going on on the other end of those conversations. So you have to assume, especially if you're a political dissident or in a, a precarious position or in a, a sp specific country, that there is a high likelihood that whatever you're saying is being recorded. That's I, that's, I think that's the bottom line. You can't fully present, uh, protect yourself or your privacy if you're using Clubhouse. I'm just looking here at a, at a post on Twitter that, that the team saw in the past 24 hours, and it's from Mega Mohan. In a clubhouse, meet Palestinian and Israelis room that has been going on for 24 hours. Actually, longer than that, because I popped into it just before the show. People from all over the world and a few on the ground, sometimes voice breaking and obviously exhausted, disagreeing over language, but so far not interrupting each other, talking for 24 hours. I'm, I'm really interested in your take here because this is where we are with Clubhouse today. What is its value, Nagar? What do you think? Well, so far, and mostly looking at the case of Iran and the United States, Persian and English are the two rooms that I drop in. I think the pros, the benefit of this, you know, adding to the uh, discussion has been a lot. People mm -hmm. have been able to talk about uh, topics that are considered taboo or red line or even everyday life and lifestyle. There are groups about parenting. There's groups about fashion. There's I even saw an actual funeral held on Clubhouse. So people from various parts of the world dropped in. There was Quran recited. There were some speeches and memor uh, real, uh, memor memories of the person being told, which wouldn't have been possible if, if without this app to be made so easy and convenient. So I think it's adding to that. It's also helping a small group of Iranians. We still have to remember this is an elite, a lot of them. Uh, probably based outside the country and also iPhone owning Iranians in the country and now some with Android just joining. But it's created a platform for more of a national dialogue on these issues. It's very political when it comes to Iranian conversation and also mm. it's a very much centered around the election. Right. And then add to that the COVID issue. Because of COVID, people are still under quarantine. Election campaigns are not really happening. There are no real rallies in person. So a lot of that is also transferred into the online space. And it seems like Clubhouse has now become the platform for this. Melissa, I feel that you helped break Clubhouse China because <laughs> you were sharing all of those uh, extraordinary stories that people were, were and those moments that were people are having online. But now, now Clubhouse China has gone. But what was its value? It, it was like drinking out of a fire hose in terms of emotions. Yeah. And I think I echo what the um, Nagar and Mark have, have said about that. And I think People aren't dumb. I mean, they do forget that it is not as private as it feels. But mm -hmm. after you use it for a while, you do realize that, yes, there is a potential that people are listening in. And I think that quite a number of Chinese decided okay. to take the risk regardless of sharing their feelings. Thank you so much, Melissa and Mark and Nagar, for unpacking Clubhouse for us. Appreciate you very much. Let me show you here on my laptop where you can find them. Mark here on Twitter. Melissa here on Twitter. Nagar here on Twitter. And if I send you an invite, you have to ask me nicely, ask me on Twitter. Uh, you can also find them on Clubhouse as well and have those conversations. But remember, it's not as private as you think. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time. Take care.